In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is our Class 21 of our Orthodox Survival Course. Last week we did an overview of the Age of Revolution, and tonight we're going to start our study of the French Revolution, which we're going to try to study carefully. It, it bears a careful study, and it rewards careful study, because if we understand the background and the, the ideas and the mechanisms, the methods, and the chronology of the French Revolution, we'll get a template for the, all the succeeding revolutions, because they use the same the revolutionaries, the conspirators use the same methods over and over again. Over the times, in the 200 years, 225, 230 years since the French Revolution, technology has changed, and world situation has changed, and so forth. But the fundamental methods of the of a, a small, uh, evil cadre um, overturning an established order of society and, and establishing a reign of terror, these same methods are used over and over again. Now, they've perfected them you know, over the past 200 years, but um, the methods are primarily the same. Um, so part one tonight, we're going to give background to the French Revolution and uh, make some important points. And next week, or rather next class, next week, we have a vigil next week for the Soul Saturday. Um, so we're not going to have class next, next Friday. We'll have class on Pentecost Friday, two weeks from tonight. I'd like to begin with a quote from a good article by Father Luke, the, um, the abbot at Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville. This, appeared, uh, this article appeared uh, in 1989, the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, in Orthodox Life magazine. Protest against authority, hostility towards, and mockery of established Christianity. The general haughty, proud, self-assured attitude towards culture, civilization, and the institutions of the past, especially monarchy, all find their roots in the French Revolution. With one sweep of violence, the ancient regime in France ceased to be. Within a few short years, the whole fabric of Russian Orthodox civilization was laid low by the same infamous spirit. The legacy of such phenomena has come down to us in the form of the opinion that having once eliminated the Christian past, modern man can nonetheless successfully manage his affairs. The immortality of man's soul exposes the deception of such an opinion. For our eternal fate is measured by the spiritual growth we gather, not from the trendy, liberated spirituality of our times, but from the rich Christian treasury of the past. It's our command right, Luke, Reflections on the 200th Anniversary of the French Revolution, article in Orthodox Life. I, I had a hard time finding the, um, the, the uh, number or the, the month of the magazine, but it, it was in 1989. Another quote. In this French Revolution, everything including its most horrible crimes, all has been foreseen, planned, contrived, resolved, decreed. All has been the result of the most profound infamy, since all has been prepared, brought about by the men who alone possessed the thread of the conspiracies long ago plotted in the secret societies, and who have known how to choose and hasten the moments propitious to their plots. It's a quote from the Abbe Baruel, Memoirs to Serve for Her History of Jacobinism. It's from the interview. Yes. Okay. Quoted by Father Seraphim Rose in his lecture six of his Orthodox Soavel course. I've got the link. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second quote above, from what is probably the most important eyewitness source for the real history of the French Revolution, states clearly a fundamental reality we must understand if we are to understand this revolution and the entire revolution of which it is a part. This was not and is not, remains not, an impersonal evolutionary force, right? or a stage in the inevitable progress of society, or the will of the people, but was and is a planned criminal enterprise of a small cadre of evil people, devoted to the most diabolical purposes and assisted and directed by the invisible diabolical powers. It was and is a stage in the working out of the mystery of iniquity, St. Paul writes of in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. This is the prism, this is the framework within which we Orthodox Christians can understand what really happened in and the true meaning of the French Revolution and every successful revolution of this evolutionary age since then. 
As we said in our class last week, in order to adopt this orthodox and spiritual understanding of the revolution, by which I mean the entire process of Antichrist revolt of the current age, of which the French Revolution was the first open move, we must uproot false principles and false information we have been brainwashed with since our early education. Remember last week I was saying that whether we grew up in a communist state or whether we grew up in the soft Marxism of the West, we're basically fed two slightly different versions of the same story. But this is more, succe- more successful. It's more successful here because it's more gradual and it's more enjoyable. We've said this before, then the in the totalitarian, um, open totalitarian, you might say crude or early Marxist um, societies, the early part of this century, um, no one's happy because when they come and they kill your parents and they steal your cow and they, they, they um, you know, take your children away and, and so forth. So people fought back. People realized this is bad. We don't like it. Right? But in the, now in the, this phase that we're in now, both in the West but now also in the East, of soft or cultural Marxism, so to speak, it's, it's more attractive and so it's more permanent. We, we talked about that much earlier in our other courses, comparing the book Brave New World to 1984. 1984 depicts a harsh, uh, violent regime. Brave New World depicts the therapeutic nanny state where everything is made comfortable and nice and enjoyable, which is what we're living in now. So uh, these are both phases of the revolution. But we were all, so whether some of us were raised in the, the uh, typical or so I'd say classical communist state, some of us were raised here in the West with the soft Marxism, but we, we, we're given two different versions of the same brainwashing, right? So we have to uproot the false principles and false information we've been brainwashed with since our early education, false principles like equality and evolution and progress, and the sovereign will of the people and the rights of man and all that sort of thing, and uh, the class struggle and uh, the rights of the oppressed and civil rights and so forth. And false, false information about the supposed evils of the old Christian order, and so forth. We have been discussing some of these bad ideas that have consequences for some time now. Our whole course really has been about discussing bad ideas that have, that have had consequences, that are leading up to this moment, to this era in history that we're in. The first open triumph of the bad ideas in the revolutionary period, the, the current period, is the French Revolution. That was the first act in this drama that we're still living in. Let's talk about sources. Part of my goal, as I've said earlier in the course, part of my goal is to direct everybody to good sources. I can't possibly. I'm an amateur. I'm a summarizer. Right? I'm just trying to get people interested in studying these things, forming an overall view of these things. Right? So one of, our, one of our important goals here is to give sources. Tonight I'm going to talk about books, lectures, and articles. Okay? We cannot possibly cover everything we need to know about the French Revolution in our little classes. Right? And so it's imperative that I give you leads on good sources for the right information and the right principles of interpretation about the revolution. And some of these, some of the reading is massive. Some of it is short. We, we'll do as much as, everyone should do as much as he or she can. There are various books I could recommend, but two that I will give you the overall picture, that two that will give you the overall picture are these. First, there's a shorter summary by a 20th century writer named Nesta Webster. And tell it simply the French Revolution. Here's a hardcover edition, or hard copy rather edition, soft cover edition right here, published by a small book, independent book publisher in America. Right. I say short, though it's 500 pages, <laughs> but it's short compared to the other more important work upon which Mrs. Webster relies to a great extent, and all, uh, all good researchers have to rely, which is memoirs to serve for a history of Jacobinism, which I quoted at the beginning of our class, by the Abbé Augustin Baruel, which is a four-volume, it's a massive four-volume work. It details very uh, clearly, very intimately, um, very concretely, all, all the, the, um, the dirty dealing and, and the, the, con- the conspiracy, the plots, the methods of the conspirators uh, that led to and then carried through the, the French Revolution. Uh, you can find, I've got a link here, of course, I know that it, we can't really, people can't really pick up the link from the hard copy of these notes, but when I send out email and and put a elect, post this electronically, it'll have an electronic link. 
to Mrs. Webster's book, which is free online, and Mrs. Webster's book is also available. You can buy it, um, buy the hard copy online. And, and it's in libraries, actually, amazingly. Um, I was in New Haven, Connecticut a few years back, and amazingly I found Nesta Webster's books in the Yale University Library. They haven't purged them yet. And they just overlook them. They don't care. Or they haven't, haven't noticed uh, Nesta Webster's books. Nobody reads. It's, no, if nobody's reading them, it doesn't matter, right? Um, and the Abbe Barwell's book can be found online. It's in the archive.org site. Barwell's memoirs illustrating the history of Jacobinism. Jacobinism is the radical uh, philosophy of the of the uh, most bloody, most radical revolutionaries. There are two, basically, we'll see next next class that there are two basic groups of revolutionaries, the, the soft and hard, so to speak. So, so the Girondists, who were the original revolutionaries, you might say they're comparable to the Kerensky provisionals, right, in the Russian Revolution. Preparing the way, yes. But then the Jacobins, who are the, the the radicals, they come in, they kill the Girondists as well as killing the king, and they kill lots of other people. Okay, so they could be the so the Girondists are comparable in the Russian Revolution. The Girondists are comparable to the Provisional Government, to the February Revolution, and the Jacobins are comparable to the Bolsheviks and the October Revolution. <clears throat> so these are these are great books, um, and and they um, they lay things out in great detail, and they're, and they're it's heavily, heavily, Webster's book is heavily documented. And Barwell's book is the, the, unmist- has the unmistakable ring of reality of an eyewitness. There's no doubt that the man saw the things he saw. He talked to the people he talked to. He heard the things that he heard. It's, it's just, it's inescapable. Okay. Now, these two sources, especially Barwell, whom Father Seraphim quotes extensively in his lecture, um, are extremely important for the information, what really happened. What went on, right? Their principles are not purely orthodox, but rather Roman Catholic and conservative Anglican, respectively. Okay, the Abbe Baruel is an 18th, 19th century Jesuit priest. Okay, not a left or a red Jesuit, so to speak, of, like we have today, but a, a pro-papal, you know, pro-ancient regime Jesuit. And Mrs. Webster was a right-wing English woman of the last century. Their respective outlooks, their framework must be understood in this light. Okay, Mrs. Webster is writing in the first half of the 20th century. She's in England, moving in aristocratic circles and seeing all around her that the majority of the English aristocracy are given over to uh, a Freemasonic conspiracy against Christian order. The Fabian Socialists, H.G. Wells, Bertrand Russell, all this is going on. So she's writing, her books are an urgent uh, expose and plea for people to wake up and realize what's being what's being hatched right there in England, but she goes she goes through other revolutions, going back to the French Revolution, to bring try to bring her countrymen and bring the Anglophone readership to a realization of what's going on. Later on in our course, we're going to talk about the the 20th century uh, British Freemasonic uh, plot against Christian order. And uh, which is very relevant to the American scene because, of course, America is much more influenced by Great Britain than by any other, any other country. Okay. The important thing, uh, the important thing is that they are not. The important thing about Father Baruel and Mrs. Webster uh, is not that we expect them to give us a purely orthodox viewpoint. We, we go to others for that. We we'll talk about that in a minute. The important thing, from our point of view, about them is that they are they are not falsifiers of the historical record. They're faithful witnesses of the historical record. They accurately put their finger on the real culprits, the goals, and the methods of the revolution. And they're reporting what, they report what happened in all its horrible details. They don't, they don't paper it over like some glory. It's a glorious victory of the people. Okay? They present it for what it was. It was mass murder. It was a blasphemous revolt against God. It was a satanic holocaust of Christian blood. Okay? So they, they're just... They lay it right out. This is this is who did it, and this is this is what they did. Okay. Now I want to talk about Father Seraphim's lectures. We have the the hard copy here with us, and also I have the PDF that I've sent out before, and I'm going to send it out again because m- many people have joined us now online, listening to the podcast, and they weren't uh, they didn't get the um, the PDF of Father Seraphim's lectures yet. So I'm going to keep sending it out the PDF of Father Seraphim's lectures, and this is. This was lecture six in Father Seraphim's series, and it's exhaustive. He quotes at very great length from Baruel and other sources. 
and so it's, it, it bears careful study. Father Seraphim covers the French Revolution in Lecture 6. You really have to read the transcript carefully and several times. He quotes important sources, including Baruel, at great length. Tonight we don't have the time to reproduce or even summarize everything in this lecture that he gave. Okay. Please study it for yourself. I'm going to attach, once again, the PDF of the lectures to the email by which I'll send out tonight's notes to our mailing list, to our group. If someone is listening to this podcast and you're not on my mailing list, write me at fatherstephenallen at stirene.com, st-irene.com. So it's Father Seraphim's lectures, that they, and Father, of course, Father Seraphim is constantly trying to give us the orthodox lens, the prism, the framework from which to view all of these phenomena. Then there are a couple of articles I want to recommend. In addition to going to Father Seraphim for our orthodox framework to understand all this information that Barry Will and Webster provide, we can turn to two much shorter uh, and accessible articles to give us an orthodox feel, an orthodox perception, right, uh, evaluation of the subject of the French Revolution. One is an article by Archimandrite Luke of Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville, New York, which I quoted at the beginning of our class tonight. It appeared originally in Orthodox Life in one of the issues in 1989. Looking at the facsimile online, I can't find, I can't see where, which issue it was. I remember getting it in the mail and reading it avidly when it came out, but nearly 30 years ago. Um, and I don't know where my copy is, and I don't know what issue it was, but it's was in 1989 in Orthodox Life, published by Jordanville, on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. You can access a photographic facsimile at, on Jordanville's website. And again, I'll, I'll send out a, um, an electronic message uh, in, in different formats with this, where this link will be alive, and you can click on it, and you can go to the article. Okay. Another more recent article that I helped to edit was produced by the Novistinic Sisterhood in Serbia. It's specifically about one important episode in the French Revolution, the uprising in the Vendée against the revolutionary government. Very important counter-revolutionary war that very few people know about. Right? It's been covered up. It's been forgotten. Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn wrote about it, and Solzhenitsyn went to dedicate a memorial there and gave a speech there. Yes. Oh. But this article also provides, besides the Vendée story, it also provides a short and readable chronology of the revolution, as well as a traditional orthodox interpretation of the events. Talk about the spiritual meaning of the events. And um, I'll send out the link to this article as well, which um, the nuns, I talked to the nuns today and they, they put it on uh, Google, uh, Google Drive so people can access it. Okay. It's online on a website in Serbian, but uh, the English, I had to ask them to locate it somewhere where I could give people access to it. So it's online now, so I can send out the link. <clears throat> so those are, those are some really important sources and if, if you just start with the articles, just start with Father Luke's article and the, and the Serbian sister's article, um, that will be a tremendous entree right, to this whole subject. Now, I, I want to deal with a false leftist interpretation of the revolution that oddly enough comes from orthodox sources. There's a famous, and, uh, among Westerners, among Catholics, there's a famous or infamous defense of the French Revolution by a man regarded as a conservative, Hilaire Belloc, who was regarded as a oh, yeah. Catholic conservative, but he wrote a whole he wrote a whole uh, defense of the French Revolution, it's fake. which is the whole thing is fake. yeah, it, it, it's just it, it's it's uh, incredible, right? That a supposedly traditional Catholic would write this. Well, we also have our traditional Orthodox, who are and they can they consider themselves very pure Orthodox, who are very anti ecumenical and anti Catholic and so forth, who are. Uh, applaud the French Revolution. Okay, so it's, this is strange, but, but we have to deal with it. A somewhat disturbing, but after all, not unexpected, <laughs> recent unpleasantness is that the, the traditional Orthodox interpretation of the French Revolution, as stated by Father Seraphim, Father Luke, the Novicinic sisters, has in recent times been denied by a certain group of supposedly Orthodox writers who speak of the French Revolution and the entire modern movement of nihilism and anarchism as, quote, a healthy reaction, an indignation of the human spirit against the heretical Christianity of the West. I think we've all met these Orthodox who say, you know, communism was a good thing, you know, right? <clears throat> these writers are so eager to be anti-Latin, and they are, they're very anti-Latin, right? Some of them are very zealous about being against the Pope and Latin and so forth, which is, in and of itself, is a good thing. But they're so eager to be anti-Latin, they throw out the baby with the bathwater, 
Well, some, on pur- some are just misled, some on purpose, yes. They simply become anti-Christian, right? glorifying or at least excusing nihilists and murderers because they're anti-Roman Catholic and anti-Protestant. Like the, in- the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Um, one especially absurd theory that some, one of these writers, is a very popular writer, uh, has floated, and some people still believe it, is the outrageous idea that the French Revolution was a revolt of the Orthodox West Roman peasantry against the papist Frankish aristocracy. Mm. Okay, which actually, I thought this was very strange when I read this by this writer. He's a very famous writer. His name is Father John Romanides, and he teaches this. Mm. All right. So I called a, I was talking to a, a young French friend of mine who's an Orthodox priest. I said, I said, this is a very strange idea. And he laughed and said, it's not a new idea. He said, the Masons created it. It was one of the myths the Masons spread, one of their mythological interpretations of what happened in the French Revolution, right? So he, but, but this Father Romanides and I guess those who believe him are, are holding up this, the French Revolution is a good thing. It's the, 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 the oppressed Orthodox West Romans that the Franks had conquered <laughs> uh, you know, 1,300 years before, <laughs> as if they, as if the, the two populations had not blended by that time. Nice right? try. Pardon me? Nice try. Nice try, yes. Uh, against the papist Frankish aristocracy, as if the mass murder of the guillotine and the satanic blasphemies of the religion of reason and, and all, all these uh, incredible satanic evils performed by the French revolutionaries were somehow a reassertion of ancient orthodoxy, right, over against papism. So you do not need to study these writers because their ideas, these ideas are not serious ideas, right? They're not serious from any, any serious intellectual point of view, right? They're, they're absurd. But you may run across such ideas, even among supposed zealot orthodox. And I, I want to warn you in advance that those ideas are out there, okay? But they're not based on anything, on any historical route. They're based, really, as I said, this idea that, that um, there are two bad ideas here. One, one is a, one is a, interpretation of the the inner spiritual history the other is a misinterpretation of historical data the the bad idea in the on the in the on the inner uh, in the inner life is that nihilism and, and atheism are a healthy reaction to heretical christianity they're not a healthy reaction they're further down the road of demonism right a healthy reaction would be to repent and return to orthodoxy right to take the good not to reject all of Christianity, but take the good and say, but where does where's this good lead to? It leads to orthodoxy. Okay? But that's not what the anarchists and the nihilists and the Marxists did, right? They just, they, you know, their motto is the motto of Voltaire, écrasez la femme, you know, destroy the whole thing. They burn it to the ground. Okay? That's, that's not, the, that's not the, the mind of a Christian, right? It's, it's the mind of a, of a demonized person. So to glorify... To, to excuse this as, well, this is a healthy reaction against the false god of, of Catholicism is, is a very, uh, it's a foolish and dangerous idea. Okay. Of course, this, and, and then the, the uh, mistake about the, the data of history is that by 1789, you did not have this um, Frankish barbarian warrior case uh, who were Arians, uh, or in this case Papists, ruling an Orthodox peasantry, you had a, a, a race that had long been blended. The Franks and, and Gallo-Romans had long been blended, and it, it had long become one single national identity and national history. And um, so this whole, the whole idea, Father Romani's uh, entire view of history is, is uh, crude and amateurish to the point of being um, laughable. It's absurd. Okay. <clears throat> of course, the separation of the West from Orthodoxy and her descent into heresy and worldliness, which we have talked about exhaustively in our course. That's what our course has been about. We're not denying that the West left orthodoxy, and she descended into greater and greater heresy and worldliness. That's our whole course has been about that, right? It did lead to this revolutionary period. It led right to it. This insight is inherent in everything we've talked about, right? But the modern revolt of these people, these occultists, Satanists, Freemasons, conspirators, nihilists, traitors, mass murderers, uh, devil worshippers, okay? It was most certainly not a revolt against what was wrong with the Western Christian nations. It wasn't a healthy reaction. It was a revolt against what was wrong. If it had been a healthy reaction against the evil in the West, it would have taken the form of repentance, right? The return to orthodoxy. Okay. 
Rather, this age of revolution is a sweeping away of what remained that was right and good. What still remained from the originally orthodox Constantinian order of Christian Europe. And the purpose was to build on the ruins of Christian society a satanic reign of anti-Christianity. So the whole idea that it was a good thing um, is a very, very bad, it, 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 very, it really hurts my heart when I see Orthodox saying things like this. You meet Orthodox say, well, you know, communism was a good thing, or um, the French Revolution was a good thing, and it really, it hurts my heart. I don't, they, how, did they, how can they possibly put this together, you know, with, with the church and with, with our faith? Now I want to talk about the country that's involved in this revolution, La Belle France, okay, France, the eldest daughter of the church. Remember the saying that we discussed last week, corruptio optimi pessima. Okay, the corruption of the best is the worst. It was necessary for the revolution that France lead the way in bringing Europe down into the maelstrom of satanic revolution because France was the leading nation of Western Europe. France established the template, what it meant to be European. They're the, the excellent nation, right? The Europeans, par excellence. Her history as France, as a distinct nation succeeding to Roman Gaul, begins with the conversion of King Clovis of the Franks in 496. Okay? Not to Arianism, which heretofore had been the confession of all the German, Germanic barbarian tribes but to Nicene Orthodox Christianity, to the Catholic faith, professed by what was then Orthodox, Rome. Okay. So the Franks were the first barbarian tribe to convert directly to the Orthodox faith. Before that, all the barbarian invaders, uh, the Goths, the Vandals, and so forth, they'd all become Arians. They rejected the Orthodox faith and became Arians. But the first, the first barbarians to convert en masse as a nation, in the person of their king, and then everybody following him, um, to directly to the Orthodox faith were the Franks. And this was King Clovis, and his wife was a saint, Saint Clotilde, who uh, who was, uh, as you might imagine, the, one of the primary agents of his conversion. Okay. The Church of Rome gave France the title of the eldest daughter of the Church because the French were the first to unite the conquered Catholic, that is, Orthodox Roman people of their lands with their barbarian conquerors to form one united Christian nation. So you have the Roman Empire in the West. It's disintegrating. It's gradually falling apart. The Germanic tribes are moving in. And at first, you have the separation. You have an Aryan warrior caste, as in Italy, for example, the Ostrogoths or Aryans, ruling the Orthodox Roman population. And they remained distinct, right? They didn't form one nation because they were separate faith, and it, it, it was a it was a very clear distinction. But then now, and then in Spain, you had the Visigoths ruling the Romans. The Visigoths were Arians. The Romans, were, the Spanish, the Iberian Roman Spanish were Orthodox, or in their term, the Catholic. In the Catholic, which is in the West, they tend to use the term Catholic, meaning the same as we mean by Orthodox. Okay. But here now in uh, Gaul, the, the, the leading barbarian chieftain converts to the Orthodox faith and expresses his loyalty to the Orthodox patriarch in Rome. And so because being the same faith, they intermarry and they become one nation. So France is the first of the Western nation, Western nations post-Roman imperial rule to become a daughter of the Orthodox Church. So that's why in the Western Church they're called the eldest daughter of the Church. Now, the anti-Latins I mentioned above, who like communism, <laughs> it's, it's their brother movement of being anti-Roman Catholic, right? They slander the Franks. Uh, they slander all the Franks from the beginning, like Ab initio, right? As being somehow genetically heretical. This is Father Romanides' whole uh, theory, that the Franks were genetically heretical. They're hopeless. They're, they were born to be heretics. Uh, her heretical from birth, so to speak. And being the Franks, the greatest villains of all Christian history from the start. Okay. But this is ridiculous. Okay. There, there are two periods of Frankish history. And the dividing line is between the Merovingian kings and the Carolingian kings. 
But the Merovingian kings are the line started by Clovis. Clovis, by the way, is our modern uh, rendering of Holodomor, which becomes um, which becomes the name uh, Ludovicus in Latin or Louis in French, Louis, Ludwig in German, Luigi in Italian. Okay, I think it means glory of the sword or something like something very Germanic, right? But um, so the the Merovingians start with Clovis, they end uh, with the uh, ascent of the Carolingian house, the the grandfather of um, the the ancestor of Charlemagne, Charles Martel, and then Pepin the Short, and then who's the mayor of the palace, and then the last Merovingian, I think his name is Chilperic the Third, he dies, and into the vacuum steps, um, Pepin the Short, and and uh, then Charlemagne. <clears throat> So basically, the, the dividing line is between the Merovingians and the Carolingians. With the Carolingian period, we start having theological problems. We start having the split in the in the church, but not in the Merovingian period. The Merovingian Franks uh, were lasted for several hundred years, and they produced saints. They were Orthodox, and they produced saints. For several hundred years, they were Orthodox. They produced saints, including Saint Clotilde, the wife of Saint Clovis, the wife of excuse not Saint Clovis. He he didn't quite make it to be a saint. He was a um, but he was his wife was a saint. Saint Genevieve of Paris, um, Saint uh, Radegunda, the uh, abbess, who's a, a Frank, uh, um, to whom the Emperor Justin sent a relic of the Holy Cross for her monastery. There's still we still have the reliquary and the piece of the Holy Cross that Justin sent to Saint Radegunda uh, and many other saints. Now, one enjoyable and spiritually profitable way to learn about this Gallo-Frankish blended Orthodox Church is through the lives of the Holy Monastic Fathers of both Roman and Frankish backgrounds. Um, this is the Vita Patrum of St. Gregory of Tours, here translated by Father Seraphim Rose, with a very important introductory material about Orthodox Gaul and the, the, the Gallo-Roman and the Frankish saints of this late, antique, early medieval period. It's a very nice book. Unfortunately, it's out of print now, but we'll try to locate copies and... Um, one of our brothers is actually scanning it, and uh, and I'm going to write the fathers to Patina. If they're not, they're not planning to reprint it, I, I really think it's justifiable to share scans with people because it's a very important book. And it on online, it's like you know you find copies for fifty, seventy-five, a hundred dollars, and so forth. So what happens on Amazon when a book goes out of a, a loved book goes out of print? Um, but it's a very good book. It's an enjoyable, spiritually profitable way to learn about this church. So St. Gregory of Tours, whose, whose hagiography is included in the book, Father Seraphim also translated the hagiography. Uh, Father Seraphim, by the way, did not read Latin, but he read French. So he translated this from French, but with the help of a friend who was a Latinist to, to check his translation. Um, <clears throat> so St. Gregory of Tours himself was a Gallo-Roman. He was not a Frank. He's from the old Roman aristocratic families who provided the bishops of Gaul for hundreds of years. And the also the curial uh, or the bureaucratic um, officers of the Roman Empire and the early Frankish kingdom. Okay. St. Gregory of Tours was a Gallo-Roman, but he chronicled the lives of holy monastic fathers of both Roman and Frankish backgrounds with equal reverence. To him, they're just all saints. Right? They weren't Romans and, and Franks, they were saints. Okay. Father Seraphim Rose translated the Vita Patrum into English, and uh, we're, we'll, try to help, try to, we'll try to help people find copies and um, again, one of our brothers is scanning it, and I'm going to contact the fathers in Platina. And if there's simply no plan whatsoever to reprint it, then I think we'll, we need to share it. And I, hope, I would hope the fathers wouldn't mind, since the purpose is to help people's souls. Okay. Father Seraphim's introductory material in this book is extremely valuable. Of course, the Franks later on, during the Carolingian period, they did lead the way out of orthodoxy. They led the way. That's why they have a bad rap. They have a, they, the later Franks do have a bad rap for a good reason, right? The, 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 the um, Charlemagne, uh, Charlemagne's court theologians, his advisors and so forth, um, sometimes tell them, well, the, the Greeks now, they're just they're heretics because they don't have the filioque, right? And Charlemagne's theological education was so poor that he called a council to pro basically to uh, um, validate iconoclasm, the Council of Frankfurt in the 790s validated iconoclasm. And then finally some of his, the, the monks and the priests, oh, uh, your majesty, uh, that's the wrong position because he didn't even understand 
the documents that were coming out of the East, right? Um, so Charlemagne was was theologically illiterate, um, and he had it. His theologians were not obviously not as well trained and not as well versed in the patristic consensus as were the the fathers in the East. So they made theological mistakes, and then he created a geopolitical problem by claiming to be the Roman imp- the the Roman emperor uh, over against the emperor in Constantinople, which is the first time. Someone had made that claim. It's the first time that the theoretical unity of the Roman Empire had been broken. Because even though these barbarian kings had ruled for centuries, they still looked to the emperor as their valid emperor, at least in theory, in legal theory. But now Charlemagne was the first one to break that mold, which is a very, a very, um, uh, a sad, uh, very critical moment in Christian history. So the Franks. Um, do start leading the way out of orthodoxy. Uh, Charlemagne's the father of the later French and German nations, of what eventually became the nation state of France, as well as the Germanic Holy Roman Empire. Right? We have discussed this earlier in our course. The Frankish Church produced the Gregorian reform of the papacy, which hardened opposition to the Orthodox East in the 11th century, or the century of the schism. Right? The School of Paris in the 12th and 13th centuries, leads the way out of patristic theology into scholastic theology. That the French create the Gothic school of architecture, which we discussed, we we're talking about high medieval art, and how the Gothic was a step away from the Orthodox vision. Right? The Franks led the way in the Crusades, which we know were problematic for us Orthodox. So in a sense, high medieval culture, that culture that we really studied very carefully when we were studying the 12th and 13th century, in a sense, high medieval culture, as distinct from the older Orthodox culture, is preeminently a French culture. But it is important to remember that throughout all the bad changes away from Orthodoxy, which did take place and were bad and were, were spiritually catastrophic, but despite all these changes, a substratum of the Orthodox culture, the folkways, and the mindset remained among the French people, really among all the Western Christian people. To Ireland. some extent. Ireland. Oh, Ireland's a great example. Ireland's a great example. Or even the Spanish colonies, if you, you uh, villages in Catholic Mexico, you know, it's amazing how some of the attitudes, the approach to life and so forth remain the same. So, or even the <coughs> the elderly people I knew in rural Louisiana in the twentieth century. You know, so, so so it's hard to kill orthodoxy completely in people, right? Because it's the real thing. And and you know, most people don't read theology or, or go to seminaries, they just keep doing what, what, what the grandparents did and so forth. Right? So, so there was always a substratum of an, the Orthodox culture, the folkways, the mindset among the people, even into modern times. I think I've mentioned the autobiography of the Abbé Gaité, Father Vladimir Gaité, who was a famous Gallican French priest who converted to Orthodoxy in the 19th century. And he said that... Um, he grew up very, as a child, very pious, very oriented to the liturgy, to the saints, to the sacraments, and so forth. Then when he went to seminary, he was taught a faith distinctly different from what he understood from his life in the village, from the life of the family. So there was this bifurcation in Roman Catholicism between the official ideology, right, and the life of the people. Okay. His books are in the his his books are available. Yes, he wrote he wrote a very important book, a history of the church and history of the church. In, two books: history of the church, history of the church in France, and this got him in trouble with the, the with Rome, and he was uh, being persecuted by Rome. And finally, he just converted to Orthodoxy. He was a seat at the church at the Russian embassy in Paris, and his name was his French name was René, and he, he uh, in Orthodoxy he he, he uh, took the name Vladimir, Father Vladimir Gaité. His book, The Papacy, is a great source. Uh, in, in the English language, English translation. Uh, that's the only book of his, I think, that's been translated into English. It would be very important for someone one day to take on uh, translating his histories, the history of the church and the history of the church in France. Okay. But so among the French people, the, an or, there was an Orthodox substratum, and their oldest, their most revered institutions came from Orthodox time, right, from the Orthodox period. Most importantly, their older patristically based monasticism, because remember there was the old monasticism. Then in the high Middle Ages, that's layered over by the new orders, Dominicans, Franciscans, blah, blah, blah. But the older monasteries were still there. 
and in many ways they carried on the older, even some of the monastic reforms of the Middle Ages were actually returned to patristic uh, spirituality, as for example the Carthusians in France, La Grande, La, La Grande Chartreuse, it's a famous um, organized hermitage in the, in the east of France. And if you read the Carthusian literature, even though it's from after the schism, it's remarkably patristic, it reads like the Desert Fathers. There's very little of the scholastic influence. So, um, so much remained from the Orthodox period, but the revolution swept away not only what was post-Orthodox, not only the bad things, right, but it also swept away the good things, what remained of Orthodoxy in the national institutions, both at the top, the monarchy, right, and at the bottom, the life of the villages, life of the monasteries. For us, this can only be viewed as a tragedy. Right? As Orthodox, we're not Roman Catholics, we're not French, but we see this as a tragedy. Right? This is part of the mystery of iniquity. This isn't some beautiful, you know, return to Orthodoxy. It's certainly not some kind of welcome revenge for the Crusades or something like that. Okay? For an Orthodox Christian to view the French Revolution with a kind of a, a Schadenfraude, uh, as the Germans say, uh, a happy gloating, you know, a happy, I'm happy that you're suffering, ha, ha, ha. Uh, gloating over this is disgraceful, right? It's not worthy of a Christian. And it's highly mistaken because you're really gloating over your own destruction because they're going to be at your, next, your front door next, right? My point in going back to this ancient history of France is that the fall of Christian France is apocalyptic. It's a sign to us. It has to be interpreted in those terms of that meta-history that we've talked about, right, of the whole thrust of history, okay? Because France was the earliest of the newly born Western nations to accept the Orthodox faith. There are no accidents in history. We have to take a sober view of this great catastrophe and understand how it relates to the entire picture of the war of the forces of Antichrist against the Church. Okay? The death blow to the eldest daughter of the Western Church opened the floodgates to the tide of revolution that was to swamp both east and west, right up to our own time. So in our next class, I wrote next week, because I, I forgot that next week we have a long service Friday night, so two weeks from now, in our next class, we'll go carefully through a chronology of the French Revolution. We'll review the chronology, starting with the, the events leading up to 1789, um, the, the conspiracies, the, revolution, the revolutionary ideas, and so forth, and then the Estates General in 1789, the Tennis Court Oath, the Girondist period, the, the Jacobin period, the Directorate and so forth, the Committee for Public Safety, Robespierre, some of the, the characters, the main characters, and then leading up to Napoleon, who uh, takes it to a new, kind of brings the chaos to an end, but then co- creates an organized campaign of exporting the revolution to all of Europe which is why he's viewed as a, as a type of the Antichrist. Okay. <clears throat> so next class, we're going to go carefully through a chronology of the French Revolution, not simply as a history lesson. We're not just going to brush up on the chronology, which probably most of us learned in some form in high school or, or in, our, in our reading as when we were kids. Not simply as a history lesson, but precisely following Baruel, following, following Father Seraphim, show the methods and the progress, the actual step-by-step movement, right, of this first revolution is a template. They perfected this model that's been used over and over again, and it's, they're still using it. So we're going to we're going to see it in its original uh, rehearsal, so to speak, or dress rehearsal, and then we can f- then up take that model and see how it's applied to later um, events in our in our Christian European history leading up to our own time. <clears throat>